am honored to introduce Tammy Krause. She has worked on federal death penalty cases throughout the United States for the past two decades. She pioneered the Legal Professions Defense Victim Outreach, which seeks to establish relationships between the defense attorneys and survivors and victims' families of violent crime in order to bridge the historical gap between the two. She is currently the National Defense Victim Outreach Coordinator for the Federal Death Penalty Resource Council Project. Her pioneering work has also been recognized with Ashoka, as well as the Soros Justice Fellowship. The title of her talk today is Holding Both And. Please join me in welcoming Tammy. We live in a moment in which communications and conversations are oppositional and divisive. Rather than trying to be community with one another, we want to try and other people. Othering people gives us a sense of control. We fit what we think is right or wrong into clear categories. Us, them, right, wrong, black, white. Yet in othering people, we distance ourselves from the opportunity of expanding our understanding, our compassion, and our sense of community. When we lose our perspective and they go unchallenged, we isolate ourselves. For the past 22 years, I've had to learn to walk the tightrope between victim suffering and offenders' humanity. Little did I know when I traveled 22 years ago with Howard Zare to meet Timothy McVeigh's attorneys that I would begin, a, by the way, as a graduate student in 1997, just throw that out, that I was beginning a journey into the suffering and grief of victim survivors. Working on behalf of the defense teams for the person accused of killing their loved ones, my job has been to hold the both and. To acknowledge the brokenness, to sit and witness the suffering, to honor the anger, and also to see the improbable arc of healing. But most importantly, my job has been to try and help identify victims' family members' needs that arise from the crime that was caused by the accused, and to try and find ways for the accused to meet the, meet, the needs met from those harms. It is to trust that despite the lack what seems like improbability and the horrors of other people's actions, that the redemptive power of humanity is possible for both the victim and the offender. A woman that I got to know had a daughter who was such an incredible bright light for the people who had the opportunity to know her. As an environmental science educator, she touched the thousands of lives that she was with. And her life was brutally taken away from her by a man who murdered her in such a manner that the coroner would not let the woman's mother fully see her daughter's body. That grief is something that I have never known. And I simply listened to her horror. I listened to her grief. I listened to her absolute bristling anger at the man who killed her daughter. I listened without judgment. Many times over calls and visits, and in time, she started to say she didn't like how the anger had consumed her. She didn't like who she had become. Crime puts a horrible burden on victims. In their darkest moments of their lives, they are forced into the criminal justice system and they are forced to watch and think about and have everything done to the accused. Rather than wait, the family urged the legal teams to do something in their interests of not spending years thinking about and hearing about the man who killed their daughter. They urged both legal teams to make a plea agreement. At the sentencing hearing, the defendant faced the mom. And he said, I am so sorry. 
I wish I could take back what I've done, but I can't. I wish I could explain to you why I did what I did, but I don't even know myself. Afterwards, the mom said, I ached for him. I ached for me. I ached for everything. I wish I could take it all back. I wish we both could change everything. Somehow, she found a way to let the light in to the darkness that had engulfed her. Interestingly, another moment that resonates is one that I experienced in my own family. In 2011, I agreed to work on the defense teams representing the, man, the men accused of orchestrating the September 11th attacks. When my husband and I explained to our sons that I would be working on this case, my then 11-year-old Sam said, what are they like? I didn't know very much about the five men at the time, but I remembered one of the attorneys said that one of the men enjoyed the animated movie Cars. So I told that to Sam. Sam's eyes grew with enthusiasm and he said, Mom, I can buy him cars too with my own allowance. It wasn't until two years later that I learned that it would be possible for the defendant to actually receive a DVD through non-legal mail. And I got a call on a Friday just before I was le about to leave for the hearings in Guantanamo Bay. If Sam wants to give him that DVD, now would be the time. My parents were visiting from Arizona and to help my husband with the boys while I was gone. It was a Friday evening two weeks before Christmas and I hadn't explained to my mom Sam's idea. While my mom supports my work because she knows that I'm trying to help families who are, have been grievously harmed by the September 11th attack, the idea that I work for the defense team for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and the other accused men stretch her. Even Sam understood that. How am I to explain this urgent errand to Sam in front of my mom? I didn't. Instead, I held Sam's hand and we thrust through the throngs of the crowds of the Friday night shopping. Mom's trying to keep up with us. We get to the media section. I look for the Cars 2 DVD. My eyes land on it. I look at Sam. He looks at the DVD. He looks at me, and I nod. He gets it. He's been waiting two years, and here we are. Sam holds the DVD in one hand, my hand in the other, and we turn around and go back to the front of the store as fast as we arrived. My mom's hurrying behind us, and she says, why are we here? What is going on? At the cash register, my mom's exasperation snapped. What is happening? Sam looks at me, and I shrug. Sam turns and looks at his grandmother, and he says, I am buying Amar Cars 2 with my allowance. My mom's silent stare said so much. Her 12-year-old grandson, knowing the first name of a defendant of the September 11th attacks, buying a gift for a man held in Guantanamo was a lot to take in. I turned and paid for the movie and we left. I took Sam's gift to Amar to Guantanamo and gave it to his attorney. On the last day of the hearings, that attorney gave me a strawberry Nutrigrain bar and he said, this is from Amar for Sam. He explained that the commissary Nutrigrain bar was one of the few things that the defendants were allowed to share with their legal team. The next day I got home at dusk, and as I was unpacking, I gave the Nutrigrain bar to Sam. He asked, what is it? And I explained to him that it was a gift from Amar for him, and I explained the story about the Nutrigrain bar. Sam asked, what do I do with it? And I said, eat it. <laughs> a while later, Sam appeared at my door and he said, I'm sorry, Mama, I don't like it. <laughs> and I said, it's OK, you don't have to eat it. But what do I do with it? And I walked over, and I took the remaining piece from him, and I said, I'll eat it. I took a bite, and to be honest, it wasn't great tasting. <laughs> I walked into the kitchen with the remnants cupped in my hands. My mom was in the kitchen when I walked in. What's that? She said. And I said, it's a Nutrigrain bar from Amar for Sam. I looked at my mom 
And I looked at the pieces and I said, want some? <laughs> Without hesitation, my mom took a piece out of my hand and we ate the remaining pieces of the Nutrigrain bar until it was all done. On a winter solstice, my mom and I stood in the dark kitchen, sharing remnants of a gift, the only physical gesture that an accused terrorist can offer to my son from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. A universal connection between people can extend beyond those that we agree with, that we look like, that live in our community, or share our same faith. I abhor acts of violence and the wide path of destruction that they wreak. And I stand with survivors and members, family members trying to find their way after life-altering tragedies. Yet I also believe that the person who perpetrates harm and destruction, sometimes espousing hateful and extremist values, is not irredeemable. And if we are honest with ourselves, we can come to understand that we also have the human capacity to hurt one another. I have come to see that we are neither our best acts nor the very worst. Our truest selves is likely somewhere in between, muddling our way to try and find community. Work to embrace both and. And may you share communion in unexpected places with unexpected people. And may those moments wrap you in abundance.